goes from us. We have, we have many streams who come here over the thousands of years. And, uh, some of us have a number of different uh, streams, Norm and those of Scots, and Ben Skate. It all goes to make up as. Since we're celebrating St. Patrick's Day, Mr. President, have you got something to say about school prayer? Uh, <laughs> 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 writing you a long letter because I haven't got time to write you a short one. Well, I really know what he means in these last few days. I have spent more time trying to do a short program than I've ever spent doing a long program. So I'm going to get straight into what I want to tell you. I'm an Irishman living in America and I thought I would tell you a few uh, little true stories about my experiences here and then warn the president about a few things that might, he might come across in Ireland sometime. I know that the president is very interested in Western art, and so am I. And on my first journey across America by car, I stopped in a little town called Ellsworth in Kansas to visit with a quite a famous American artist called Charlie Rogers. He's a very good Western painter. And my wife and I were wandering through his little museum, and this as I described, rather elderly, Gene Autry-looking figure in a, in a dude cowboy suit and a bola, looked at us very suspiciously and asked us, could he help us? We said no. And then eventually said, do you want to sign the, the visitor's book? And he was very dour-looking. So we signed the visitor's book. And he looked over and he said, are you, uh, are you really from Ireland? I mean, from Ireland? And I said, yes, we're, we're on our way back to Ireland now, as a matter of fact. And then a grin broke across this huge craggy face, ear to ear, and he said, I'm part Irish and part Indian. He said, as a matter of fact, my daddy used to say to me, Charlie, you're enough Irish to get in trouble and enough Indian to stay in it. <laughs> While I was in that part of the country, able and saying, the greatest storyteller of them all is Ernest Hemingway. And Jack said, I couldn't hear what the other fellow was saying, but he was obviously driving the red-faced, white-haired man mad. So Jack said, well, here was my cue. And I got up and ambled over and said, excuse me, gentlemen. And they turned and snarled at me. And I said, you know, before you attack me, just let me tell you that I even heard of. His name was Morris Walsh. And the red-faced, white-haired man said, oh, my God, I'm Morris Walsh. <laughs> so... Morris Walsh, as you may remember, wrote the story that John Ford's wonderful film that starred Duke Wayne and, and Maureen O'Hara, uh, The Quiet Man. That was uncle, because I think you will find that there's a terrific family resemblance there. <laughs> anyway, we, we'll get an artist to work on it if you think it isn't like him enough, James. <laughs> so, I wanted to tell you one of my, my favorite stories about Ireland. Uh, Funny, but Sean was a teacher, and he would tell this story of a little school outside Cahar Sivin in Kerry. Really beautiful, beautiful part of here. Was listening very attentively, but not writing. He said, Tommy, why aren't you taking down your dictation? And I said, I'm sorry, sir, I has... I think I was told to wait here till the president came up, so I'm, <laughs> I'm taking my stage directions. 
Thank you, sir. I was going to stall <laughs> and hope you'd say something else. <laughs> thank oh, you. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's been a wonderful Most pleasure great. and a wonderful honor. Thank you. No. Thank you. Thank you. be a question about me being Irish since I came up here without this <laughs> the day before St. Patrick's Day. Well, I know we all enjoyed Mr. Dowling and I wish he hadn't had to shorten the program. Mr. Prime Minister, Mrs. Fitzgerald, ladies and gentlemen, I want to say how delighted that Nancy and I are to have you and Mrs. Fitzgerald here today. I know you've been to America a good deal. You're acquainted with us. But we're very proud that you could be our guest on your first visit here as Prime Minister. And we're especially happy to have you visiting at such an appropriate moment. Tomorrow is a great day in America, a day of bagpipes and shamrocks, and a day when everyone is Irish, or as the saying has it, wishes they were. In the United States, Especially the impact of the Emerald Isle on our culture and history is enormous. America is today, because of the Irish, a richer, brighter, freer, and yes, a bit noisier country than it otherwise would have been. Virtually all Americans feel a surge of pride when they hear expressions like the Fighting 69th or the Fighting Irish of Notre Dame. I have to pause for a second. I've already told this to some of you, but I to tell the rest, as I know that Father Hesburgh is here in the room someplace from Notre Dame. Back in the days of the great Knut Rockne, when Notre Dame was the giant of the football world, it was between halves one day of the game when the officials came into the locker room and said to Rockne that the other team was complaining that the Notre Dame players in the pileups were biting them. <laughs> and he said, we can't find them, of course, and Rock, uh, what do you think we should do? And Rock says, tell him next year to play us on Friday. <laughs> but so many of our great public figures are of Irish ancestry, from the man considered by many as the father of the American Navy, John Barry, to our first heavyweight champion, John L. Sullivan, to the great tenor John McCormick, to a couple of presidents of the United States, and yes, even to the current Speaker of the House. <laughs> In fact, the secret wish disclosed by the other day by my friend Tip O'Neill is an indication of the hold that Ireland has on all of us here in the States. This is a nation where the Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives aspires to someday be ambassador to Ireland. <laughs> Tip, what about day after tomorrow? <laughs> Mr. Prime Minister, I was explaining to Tip only a few moments ago, though seriously, why I thought that appointment was impossible. And perhaps knowing your countrymen as you do, you'll agree with me. Tip, the Irish aren't looking for speakers. They're looking for listeners. <laughs> well, Mr. Prime Minister, the joshing we do here is in the best Irish tradition. It makes light of what are sometimes serious political differences. But I think there's one point on which the speaker, Senator Kennedy, myself, and the other Irish American leaders here are united. Our admiration for the efforts that you are making to bring peace and stability to Ireland. We support your personal mission in America to end the tragically misguided support of some here for terrorist elements in Northern Ireland. And you, Now, you know, Mr. Prime Minister, I've been told by one of your countrymen that the Reagan family line goes back as far as the great 11th century warrior king, Brian Peru. If it's true, I'm exceedingly proud. But sometimes, like you, I wonder what our brave ancestors, those who fought so gallantly over so many centuries against such hopeless odds, 
what they would say about the valor of people who commit acts of violence and prey on the innocent, sometimes maiming and killing innocent women and children. Your words have been very direct on this point, Mr. Prime Minister. You've reminded those in this country who provide assistance to Northern Ireland's terrorists that they are assisting in violence and murder. Let me assure you that the vast majority of Irish Americans join you today in condemning support for those who preach hatred and practice violence in Ireland. But there's another part of your mission to America, Mr. Prime Minister, which is perhaps more fitting to today's festive atmosphere and more important over the long run. And that is the message of hope that you bring us. We're especially heartened by your own efforts, as well as your colleagues, in the New Ireland Forum and the British government as they seek a democratic and peaceful reconciliation of Ireland's diverse traditions. As we know, the high-level dialogue between Ireland and Britain has been renewed, and the groups promoting reconciliation and economic cooperation, groups like Cooperation Ireland, are also bearing fruit. For our part, we shall continue to encourage American firms to invest in Ireland, north and south, in ways which promote prosperity and both traditions. Some time ago, a former American ambassador told me of a weekend retreat where politicians from the various Irish traditions met together for a frank discussion of the differences that separated them. And it was a good weekend. Those who'd never talked of such matters before were able to speak and listen to each other in a spirit of understanding. And on the bus back home, they laughed and sang songs. The spirit of friendship bloomed. When they got off the bus, the spirit somehow seemed to evaporate. And after hearing this story, I told our ambassador to take them a message, and I think it bears repeating. Mr. Prime Minister, I express your sentiments, sir, and those of our own people, and to the people of both parts of Ireland, when we say to all those who, in, who struggle with the problem of peace in Ireland, please get back on the bus. <laughs> From my discussion with you this morning, Mr. Prime Minister, I know how deeply you are committed to this effort. I assure you the hopes and prayers of the American people go with you. Peace and good cheer have never left Irish hearts. And so we look to days of peace and harmony to come when every day we may say what is said on St. Patrick's Day. Oh, Ireland, isn't it grand you look like a bride in her rich adorning, And with all the pent-up love of my heart, I bid you top of the morning. But now, may I ask all of you here to join me in a toast to our friends, Prime Minister and Mrs. Fitzgerald, and to the warmest and best friendships, Ireland and the United States. Thank you, Mr. President, for those warm, encouraging, and heartening words, which I think will, will bring comfort and, as you said, cheer to all our people in Ireland. Joan and I, and all of us from Ireland, are very grateful to you and Mrs. Reagan for your warm welcome, your splendid hospitality in this beautiful and historic setting provided by an Irish architect, James Hobel. There's always a special friendliness about the American welcome that makes the visitor, especially the Irish visitor, feel very much at home. We like to think that this is an aspect of the American character that derives from the Irish part of your heritage. <laughs> no other country has a warmer place in Irish hearts than the United States, nor is any people prouder than we are of the contribution our forebears have made 
to the development of this great nation and is being made indeed by the 43.7 million of them who are still ha ha working hard at it. <laughs> it's sometimes forgotten that the Irish ethnic tradition in American society historically has had two strands. The better known today is the predominantly Roman Catholic tradition of the immigration that swelled to huge proportions after the great famine of the 1840s. A strong tradition indeed it was and still is the deep and positive influence on American society. But it was not the only nor the earliest tradition which the Irish brought to these shores. Most of the early Irish immigrants were Protestants, very many of them from what is now Northern Ireland. Such were eight of the nine men of Irish birth or descent who signed the Declaration of Independence. And such were the great majority, and here I beg leave, sir, in your own house to correct you, the great majority of the dozen American presidents, I think you said a couple, the dozen American presidents of, <clears throat> of established Irish origin. I, I know that the rest of them just never got round to tracing their roots properly. <laughs> in America, Irishmen of these two great traditions of our island have worked together to shape this wonderful country. We in Ireland hail them all with equal pride. But in one part of our island, these two traditions have not yet come to terms with each other. Within Northern Ireland, the two Irish traditions are sharpened into separate identities which have confronted one another in mutual and sometimes violent antagonism. With this tragic situation, we in the South cannot remain unconcerned. For these people, Catholic and Protestant, nationalist and unionist alike, are our own people. Their troubles are ours. And in the solution of their problems, we have a crucial role to play, one that must be undertaken in a spirit of open-mindedness and generosity. To reconcile the conflicting identities of the two traditions in our island and to suggest new political structures that could accommodate both of them are the main tasks to which we and the four political parties of Irish constitutional nationalism, North and South, representing 70% of the people of our island, have dedicated ourselves through the unique deliberations of the New Ireland Forum. In undertaking this task, Mr. President, let me say how much we in Ireland value the encouragement that in your own words today, you yourself have given to this cause of Irish reconciliation, together with the support of other great Irish-American political leaders, some of them with us today here, Speaker O'Neill, Senator Kennedy, Senator Moynihan, and so many others who have given us comfort and heart and courage to continue with our work. It was the great Abraham Lincoln who wrote, Among free men, there can be no successful appeal from the ballot to the bullet. He answered a century and more ago the claim by certain violent men in our island to take power with a ballot box in one hand and an Armalite rifle in the other. When the Irish people come together, it will be in one way only, in peace, by agreement, under structures devised for the security of all the island's people and for the advancement of all their interests. We know, and you've made it explicit today, Mr. President, but in our efforts to promote that process, we have your support and encouragement. May I turn to your forthcoming visit with your wife, wife to Ireland? Already, this visit is the subject of conversation and excitement throughout the length and breadth of the land. We know how much you cherish your Irish heritage and how much you are looking forward to setting foot in that tiny village in County Tipperary which, as I said to you, fortunately has a wide main street to accommodate all the people who would be there when you come, um, from which your great-grandfather stepped out bravely one day to face the world, as my own grandfather did also to the same place, London, a decade later from a place not seven miles away from Ballyporeen. My father returned to Ireland half a century later to take part with my mother in the movement for Irish freedom. It's because they came back 70 years ago that I shall be there with Joan to welcome you and your wife on 2nd June next when you return for this visit to the land of your ancestors, the first of several, the last of, not the last, one of a number of such visits. <laughs> there have been others before, and there will, I hope, sir, be others in future also.
Believe me, you'll receive a warm Irish welcome on that day and the succeeding days that you spend with us. A Caird meal of folter, as we say in Ireland, 100,000 welcomes. Mr. President, I've already presented you with some shamrock. We had a little difficulty. I tried pinning it on, but uh, partly because of my concern to make sure I didn't actually physically assault the President of the United States by sticking the pin in him, I totally failed. The President took over the job himself and did it very neatly and quickly. Uh, but um, if I might f formally present you with a, a, a bowl of our shamrock so there'll be some to go around the whole time. <laughs> So, uh, I've done, I've done for some, something for me. Oh, good. Do I put this on? Well, or you just, you don't have to keep it, but there. <laughs> How's it look? It's a very important hour. I take my hat off you, though. <laughs> now, I've done precisely what the president did, only he remembered in time. I left my glass behind. Uh, I wonder, could you just uh, uh, let me... The president and Mrs. Reagan. <laughs>